asked a bicycle brand leader one time this year, I said, please tell me that somewhere, somewhere in the industry, there's a collective consciousness around like the dealers surviving this. And and someone said to me, there's not. Uh, I think for sure, it's human emotion colored every decision we made. And that includes our own ambition level at wanting to grow, our own excitement to be growing after years of kind of laying the groundwork for it. Um, a little bit of euphoria from that. Interest rates change and, you know, the, the debt in those deals is typically held by the company. And so now the company's looking around going, oh, hey, guys, shit, we got to we got to cover, I don't know, pick a number, you know, quarter million yeah. dollars a month in in debt service. Looking at things all the way, going all the way back to 2008, is like, this is not a COVID problem. Yeah, it's a big problem. Like, COVID has really spiked things, but like, they've been doing this for, for decades. Like, this is a problem that's been around since the dawn of time for these guys. In episode three, we heard about what much of the bike industry experienced during that dramatic slowdown of bike sales and what resulted. In this episode, episode four, we'll hear about some of the learnings and takeaways from the past three years and put forward some tough questions for the bike industry to ask itself. You'd have cash flow issues with the amount of inventory you're holding. You're not making any money on these, these sell-throughs. What is the shining light in any of this? Is there is there service um, that you can make up for on that? Is there anything else? I'm very curious about the bike industry's argument that bicycle dealers will survive on service alone. If you've been a bicycle dealer, that like, oh, okay, if we go to direct to consumer or if your margins get cut in half, you'll just do more service. Really? Mm. I would really love to know how many strategists at a bicycle manufacturer have ever actually run a bicycle service department. Why, why, what, like, what is the data that would make anyone think that we're just going to fill a gap on service? It's it's like something that people love to say, like there has to be demand for service, Yeah. right? Yeah. Where's all the extra demand for service going to come from? Especially coming in your winter. Yeah. I mean, like, oh, just fill the gap with service. Oh, okay. No problem. Like, mm. the, I think it's very interesting when people say that, like, oh, what's the shining light you're making? It, well, where, if, where's the, where's the service demand going to come from? In general, Wade, I would say that, again, I'm a bit like honest heretic that says these things. I I have not seen as an independent bicycle dealer when I'm talking to a representative of a manufacturer that I work with. It's not often I'm presented with like really compelling, compelling macroeconomic data or even really sophisticated target market analysis. Like this is who our buyer is. This is what we think they're going to do next year, largely because they don't have that first person data. What have you been doing? At, at Sports Garage to be able to to manage the situation. We decided that we would do whatever it takes to sell our aging inventory. And we decided that we would cut back on what we were ordering. I mean, now it's kind of tough because we're in the opposite situation. Remember the conversation we had about like order everything because if we happen to get model A unloaded in the port, then we can give you model A, right? It would take us back to that time in 21 where the demand was so constrained. Like you would, you try and sell bikes based on what manufacturers could deliver you. Yeah. Right. I can't get that, but I can get that. I can get everything now. And after nine months of buying things and then manufacturers dropping their prices, buying things, manufacturers dropping their prices, we have several top performing models in our store that have the exact same MSRPs that they did in early 2017. Yeah. Okay. Full price bikes with MSRPs, top performing models that are now back to 2017 prices. Why would I place a normal preseason order? Now the exact opposite thing is happening. Where yeah, before yeah. you're like, oh, I got to keep ordering because I want to make sure I have bikes to sell. Now I'm like, why the H-E double hockey sticks would I order more? Because this year's performance looks like I'm going to buy it and you're going to cut the price and I'm going to buy it and you're going to cut the price. So yeah. you know what I'm going to do? I'll wait. And since I know you have more than enough inventory, I'll order bikes when I need bikes. And so it's like ground to a halt. I mean, we had to have another couple of uncomfortable conversations in that situation, right? Because here we are, we've been a good dealer slash buyer. And um, I say that jokingly, okay? Everyone that's listening, I'm saying that with a smile on my face. Wade can see that I'm smiling because we love being bike shop owners. Like what I want to say though is um, when you are a good dealer, you may have certain sort of whatever the manufacturer's preferential status is, right? They'll say, oh, that's a gold dealer or that's a, a premier dealer, or that's a preferred dealer, or that's a partner dealer, or that's a ride center, or like whatever, right? Like 
a lot of brands will say they'll try to find a way to point to the top performing dealers. Usually those top performing dealers may have demo equipment or they may have uh, more bikes available mm-hmm. or they've got better Google reviews or like, you know, every manufacturer kind of does it a little bit differently. We had a couple of manufacturers, not one, not two, I think about three say, all right, well, um, well, you're going to lose your pricing status then. If you don't put in your full order, we're going to knock you down out of the, what you know, mm-hmm. we're not going to give you any price preferential pricing treatment anymore. Is there a difference so, there between um, distributors or brand direct with how brand, that's... We're brand direct with all of our brands. Right. Okay. Okay. It, it take, yeah. take away the, 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 the over inventory um, and back to your point earlier, you know, from what are we descending from? Yeah. Would you say that because people have in the industry have told me that the high end is actually doing really well. It's the, the $3,500 and less spikes that aren't doing well. Um, would you say that the demand is still there? If you were to take away all of this stuff, this would be fa- a fairly normal situation or is that changed? I think it's a, it's cyclically appropriate. Right. If you look okay. at the history of the bike industry, right? It, there's been like some flat trajectories, some climbing trajectories. There's also been some segments that boomed. Like if we go back and look at an let's call it a 70 year history of cycling. We've seen road bike booms. We've seen mountain bike booms. This mm-hmm. is a whole other great podcast topic for you, by the way, right? Mm-hmm. Is like how, how much more, you know, what, what's our, the, what's the new technology we're pushing now, right? Yeah. So are, you know, are we going to see the e-bike boom? I think it's cyclically appropriate. And, you know, even though our year end profit and loss statement this year does not look like what we wanted to look to, our unit sales were the same. It was just that our margins yeah. were so much smaller. Yeah. So, yeah. And it actually, I did the calculus on it the other day and I mapped out where we were in 2019 and kind of like where we wanted to get to in 2004. Cause we always are kind of looking at this one, three, five year plan, like trying to be good business owners. And then we saw where, you know, that was the line. And then I mapped what were actual results were in 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Right. And I'm talking about net income. And then I drew the curve back up to match where we were in 24, which is like half of what it was in 23, right? But more than it was in 2019. And if you do the calculus on all that money we earned and then the money we gave back this year, you know what? We are pretty much exactly where we'd hoped we would be back in 2019. Yeah. So, you know, you know, when I think about the silver lining, when you said, what's the silver lining here? Mm-hmm. Really savvy operators are not freaking out. Are you freaking out? Savvy operators have built a stable base of demand base. If they look back and say, hey, if we dollar, you know, if we kind of average what our goals were, like, are we where we would have been? Are we doing what we could have been doing if the pandemic had never happened? Would you have done anything differently being at this point right now? Is there anything you you could not even would have, but could have? I don't know. That's a really good question. I mean, you know, like, would I or could I have done anything differently? You know, armed with today's knowledge, I think, oh, yeah, I would have just been more vocal. Well, no, I didn't know. None of us knew. Like, yeah. we didn't know. Yeah. We were kind of all doing things. I actually, I hate to say this, but I don't think I would have done anything differently. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, in the rearview mirror, I think maybe we would have come into 23 with slightly less inventory. But at that time, having come out of the chaos or kind of like, you know, still kind of like emerging from the chaos, it didn't seem like an egregious number at the time. If I did anything differently, I might have called the whistle on our business a little sooner than we did. But that's, again, that's totally the rearview mirror. And it's a timing thing versus a a timing thing. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. It's a timing thing. So, I mean, I think that, you know, we had to absorb that, you know, rat going through the belly of the snake. I think our you know, right now, we started in 2020 with the cautious optimism and the conversation ends in 2023 with cautious optimism because Mm. back then our cautious optimism was like, how are we going to get the bikes? And now it is, um, how are we going to keep our, you know, how are we going to, what's our buying strategy so that we can get back to, you know, full margin transactions. Yeah. Yeah. I know manufacturers would like to get back to full margin transactions, um, you know, and now we have a whole new group of dealers who are going to need another windfall because they've got bike that have effectively, you know, they don't present any income potential for them. Yeah. The, the obvious nuance is all that is you have to make a profit on these bikes. There needs to be a margin on these bikes. A lot of people think that they're selling bikes, that they're doing fine, but that's not, yeah. that's not yeah. the game. 
I think something I thought about before we were going to visit is that I, I wanted to say something that's going to sound kind of weird. And so I'll explain it. But like, in a way, I understand that bike manufacturers don't owe us anything, right? There are other industries for which the independent dealer has become irrelevant. Like how many independent shoe stores are there? How many independent ski dealers are there? Like, think about the number of stores that just used to be owned by a mom and pop, right? They just sold shoes. They just sold fishing tackle. You know, they just sold uh, fabric that women would sew with or men would sew with. They just sold, you know, whatever, right? And main streets were full of mom and pops. There were running stores that were just independently owned running stores, right? They weren't franchises or they weren't part of a large chain or they weren't baked into a great big sporting goods store, right? Or they're brands that are super hot that are online only. We, we can talk about that for days, about mm -hmm. like the transformation of our economy. So in a way, I understand. I asked, I asked a bicycle brand leader one time this year, please tell me, please, please tell me, because I didn't go to Sea Otter. I didn't go into any kind of bicycle. I said, please tell me that somewhere, somewhere in the industry, there's a collective consciousness around like the dealers surviving this. And and someone said to me, there's not. Yeah. So I just want to say, I just want to publicly acknowledge, right, that like the manufacturers don't owe us anything. That's just kind of sad. Right. And I yeah. think that there will be, I think more dealers will go out of business. Yeah. That, that middle you were talking about, or is it vulnerable? Yeah. yeah. It's vulnerable. There's a vulnerable middle. I think, you know, everybody feels a little vulnerable this year, like, because there's still this massive inventory that has to get, can that it has to be absorbed somewhere. It has to be digested somewhere. Yeah. Maybe my last question is, uh, are there any miracles that need to happen or just things that need to happen to start seeing the, the, the industry start seeing its way out of this? Anything that, yeah. whether it's a miracle or just. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, if we could come up with some sort of like microorganism that safely digests carbon that could just start eating bike frames that are in warehouses and shipping containers, we'd be doing okay. They just need to sell, eh? Yeah. To I'm a just, I'm imaginary I'm being super market. facetious, but like yeah. that would be a miracle, right? Yeah. Like yeah. make this stuff go away. I mean, that's that's that that's the facetious joke I make about a, a carbon you know, like a, a environmentally friendly, sustainable carbon eating microorganism. Yet yeah, that's a joke, but it's my joking way of saying like the miracle is like, just make this stuff go away. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, that's how far off it is. Is that, that kind of what the, you're saying? Yeah. That's, that's how it feels. I mean, right. you know, the, probably the first year ever that some manufacturers are like, we're not releasing any new models. We're not even changing our colors. I'd love to give you some honest answers that, that are my personal opinions. When you say like, what can we do? It, obviously, the like sustainable, environmentally friendly carbon eating microorganism is probably not a reality. But what if out of this situation, manufacturers decide that their biggest investment next year is going to be filling the gaps of the first person data that perhaps could have led them to better forecasting? Yeah. Right. What if one of the shining lights is that IBDs are like, I have to stop reading too much news from the cycling industry online every morning and I need to start studying my PL and my balance sheet. Mm. I need to build a cash flow plan. The shining lights are the opportunities that businesses will take to improve, right? And let's say that you are a component brand and you are building to an order and those orders are coming from a manufacturer with a name on the down tube. What if you're a component brand and your commitment is to have better information about the target market than the people that are giving you their order? Right. Like yeah. somewhere, I, I think for me, I just kept I just kept feeling this entire time. Like, why don't we think that this is like, why is it OK to believe egregious numbers that there's nothing macroeconomically that substantiates? Yeah. And like where, where what was the, and the timing, of course, somewhere? I'm sure there's some very intelligent people that threw a red flag. But, you know, I, I think that that's what I'm left wondering and hoping for. That's what I'm left hoping for is that the businesses who can sustain as we you know, digest this inventory, that they will use this as a period of reflection on a deep level of what in their business process they have to improve. Here's Seven Mesh CEO again, Tyler Jordan. Is there light at the end of the tunnel right now going into 2024 that you can see? Whether I can see the light or whether I know the light is there, um, I feel weirdly optimistic about the future for our brand. And I say that out of a sum total of things that I know about what impacts us personally. So I can't speak to the industry right now. I don't have enough viewpoint on that. 
we know that we have a product pipeline of good innovations we're continuing to launch, and we have some really strong stuff coming uh, for future seasons we're, we're really excited about. Um, we had pretty sustained growth on the consumer side, and our consumer business still continued to grow last year. So we're seeing, you know, we're hearing some positive developments on the wholesale side of our business for the whole industry. Um, but we don't see a strong uptick there yet. And we're kind of waiting and working with our retailers to see how things are developing for them. So, you know, we're continuing to see optimism for the future and what we're building everything, you know, we're, we're talking about everything on a two-year timeline and we're consciously communicating, you know, deliberately with all of our staff, with all of our partners and stuff that we almost feel like we could predict 2025 better than 2024 at this point. There's still a lot of uncertainty around this year around how things are going to unfold. Whereas by 25, we expect to just have a bit more clarity. And so not necessarily seeing the picture is going to be a lot better. We are expecting an improvement and we're expecting to kind of resume growth at a at a better cadence and stuff. But it's unclear exactly how that's going to unfold to me right now. Um, I do expect 25 and 26 to be, to be good years for us. But that's with the specialized knowledge I have of the things that we're going to be deploying and kind of some of the exciting you know, exciting things we can do because we can't just sit and wait for people to decide to resume business with us. We have to make sure we're building great things that have a deal and we have to help, you know, we have to control our own destiny and kind of create some opportunities for ourselves. So we have that motion. We have some great things coming and we're excited about that. But I would certainly love to see more positive signs that 2024 was going to get a lot better. And I will say that I think from a behavioral point of view, there's a lot of people behaving like this is not going to get better the same way there was a lot of people behaving like the pandemic boom was never going to stop. And I definitely have concern that we have not learned our lesson about about supply chain trauma and where we could end up a year from now. And so uh, people forget how quickly that inventory went from everywhere to non-existent. And we're not in the same situation today, but are we paying attention to it? I think you're, I think you're asking the right questions, Wade, and I'm looking forward to hearing some other answers to them. Last question. In hindsight, in totality, with what you know now, is there anything you could have done differently? Not would have, but could have given the the choices you were forced with. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's fair to say that while I'm comfortable with my choices, I don't think they were optimal. You know, we were operating, trying to make good decisions in a very dynamic environment for two, three years where things were changing weekly or daily in during periods of that. Um, and making important decisions for our business in that context. And in that context, which was scary, exciting, dynamic, supercharged, uh, and hitting a group of people at our particular small business that had been working for five or six years as a micro company, like, like not paying yourselves, like, you know, the whole thing to get off the ground and to get some lift and get some traction right before the pandemic and then have the pandemic accelerated it. It was extremely hard to know what was going to happen. And so, uh, I think for sure, human emotion colored every decision we made. And that includes our own ambition level at wanting to grow, our own excitement to be growing after years of kind of laying the groundwork for it, um, a little bit of euphoria from that. Uh, like I see people online talk about companies being greedy or forecasting infinite growth and stuff. And it's like, no, no it's, it's, it's not like that at all. But when we have orders from our dealers saying, hey, your product's selling through, this is fantastic, send me more. You know, the first thing you do isn't put your hand up and say, are you sure you want that? Like when you've been working at it for five years, the first thing you do is take the order. And the second thing you do is deliver it. And the third thing you do is figure out how to build more. And the fourth thing you do is think, should I build more? And under normal circumstances, something like the pandemic doesn't happen that radically changes demand over a, a narrow period of time. And so I think we all didn't have the, none of us had the job experience, mental experience, the decision-making framework to know how to play that. And so I, I just think, like, I think we made pretty reasonable and prudent choices and generally did okay. But I look back and think, well, you know, should I have built a little bit less inventory then? That kind of thing. Yes, I probably should have. And I probably should have done a better job uh, ensuring that we had a way to pressure test our own decisions and make sure we were doing them properly. And mm. maybe I'm splitting hairs. Like I said, I think we did a pretty reasonable job. Um, but I think I could have done that. And I think I should have done a better job of sourcing information that could corroborate my view on what was happening. This is all 2020 hindsight. I'm not much of a regrets guy. Uh, I work hard and do try to do try to make the right decisions, and I do my best every time. And so, if I find out later it was a mistake, there's only so much beating yourself up you can do. Uh, we live in a world where the future is unpredictable, and I'm happy with that about that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we make our best decisions and move forward. The next time I'm in a world changing pandemic and the whole world is falling apart, I'll try to be uh, 
really thoughtful about the signs of how that might it might be might be reversing anytime soon. Um, but uh, I don't have big regrets. But I think uh, there's some nuance that could have helped us all go a little bit further. And I'm I'm I kind of think as an industry, I'm concerned that we haven't learned a global lesson as a like if you want to think of the industry as a community, are we going to behave any differently next time? Other than how it impacts us personally, I don't know. I you know. We're not coming together and sharing information and, and ensuring transparency and and uh, all coming together in a kumbaya moment. We're fighting for our lives. And uh, so it's understandable that that's the way it went. Next time, I think that have more personal human conversations early. Make sure you understand uh, the impact of your choices on the businesses and the people that you're impacting. And make sure that people that are important to you understand that if they make choices, it's going to impact you as well. And I think that's maybe the one takeaway lesson that I really have. I use the word partnership. And when I say it, I mean it. And I'd say that I'm going to use that word more carefully again after the pandemic, because there were some partnerships I witnessed and heard about. I would have thought that was a strong partnership. And when I heard about what happened, I'm like, well, that's not much of a partnership. And and we saw some of that ourselves too, obviously. So, you know, people got understandably selfish pretty quickly in a way. I would have expected a little more compassion about the impact that had on other people when they did it, and they didn't always see it. So I thought that was a little that was a little disappointing about human behavior to me. This podcast is brought to you by our members at Escape Collective. They paid for it along with absolutely everything we do. But instead of giving ourselves a shameless plug in this mid-roll, I wanted to give a shout out to all of the outstanding people who run independent bike shops who are getting through this time. If you're a consumer of cycling goods, please support these small businesses in your local area who service your community. If there's ever a time they need your support, it's now. No matter how small it is, it will make a difference. Thank you. One thing that's been missing from this series is having someone from the big three, that's Giant, Specialized, or Trek, on the record about their experiences during the COVID boom and bust. I've spoken to many, but understandably, none have wanted to put their voices on this podcast. But over the past week, I got chatting to a gentleman named Matt Laylor, who worked for Trek Australia from 2020 to 2023. Matt agreed to share his experiences with me when he was hired by Trek as a logistics and operations specialist. He was tasked with the massive job of improving their systems, processes, and technology to handle and scale Trek's ERP systems throughout the supply chain, which he says were totally manual and siloed when he came in. Now, some of what Matt has to say backtracks a little bit towards topics in previous episodes, but I wanted to include this because it's difficult to imagine the enormous scale of this problem many of these brands face and are facing, and Matt's experience gives you a good insight into this. So what happened then, the, the perfect storm happened for Trek where lockdowns in Shanghai were underway. We were still getting bikes uh, trip feeding in from Taiwan because they do all the high-end stuff and there was obviously supply issues with Shimano and, and whatnot. So I think a lot of your high-end road bikes and, and dual suspension mountain bikes coming out of Taiwan. And then we're getting a lot of sort of the low-end, you know, hybrids and all that sort of stuff coming out of Cambodia. So they were coming in pretty well. And we we're, were managing to fill orders and fill up. But probably demand, probably new demand for bikes probably started dropping off a bit somewhere in 2022. But because we weren't filling all these back orders, retailers didn't start cancelling back orders because they still thought there was shortages, right? So they kept there, don't cancel your back orders because you'll miss out on the queue. But that was probably the first underlying sign that, and that probably got missed. And then once the lockdown in Shanghai was relieved, it was a tsunami of bikes. Really? An absolute tsunami. Of, yeah, it was incredible. Like we shipped, like it, we just kept breaking records on what we were shipping per month. It was just ridiculous for the rest of 2022. All of a sudden, if you remember that we had bikes that were um, not in the warehouse, so retailers' back orders were what they, the dates that they would see were going all the way up to the purchase orders. As soon as things were relieved, the bottleneck in Shanghai, they dropped the, the date and they shipped them. And that's when I start entering or we start entering the dates. Hey, they're going to arrive in three weeks. And the retailers are like, hold on, like I don't, I can't handle all the hundreds of bikes arriving to me in three weeks. So what started happening was sales and customer support started working with the retailers and cancelling thousands of back orders. Like I'm talking thousands. In a space, I think of like a week or so, in Australia, there was 30,000 back orders, like units 
spike unit cancelled. Wow. And there was no communication to the logistics department. So where where are these bikes going to go? Into a warehouse? Like, and we all of a sudden, and we weren't told we, there was no communication. So we were getting these bikes in our warehouse. We're going, hold on, why are there tons going into storage? Why are there no back orders for these? And I thought, oh no no, there's some that because we were given monthly reports from forecasting on, hey, this is our inventory forecast for the next month based on sales, based on inbound. But it was a manual static report that we didn't have access to, we had to request it. So we would do that, we'd get it, and we would rely on communication from the rest of the business on what's going on with sales and back orders. But there was none. So we had a total blind spot. Basically, bikes just started coming in in thousands and filling our warehouses to the point where we reached capacity and we had to panic open new warehouses. So, like, what did we have? We had three in Australia. So one of them, so our our main Sydney warehouse filled up in, like, a month or two out of nowhere. This is in the back half of 2022. And then we had, we just had to panic, like, work with our 3PL who were unreal through this, uh, and they just managed to find storage facilities and dump bikes in there. Really? Totally dumped. One of them was like a makeshift car park, <laughs> underground, like secure car park. Yeah, yeah, wow. incredible. And they, they were just putting bikes in there. So we knew what was on the shipment, but once they went in there, there was no inventory tracking, no control, there's no system set up. So we were like, I think there's the, those bikes over there, there's these bikes here, and they were just stacked randomly. Yeah. So it was a nightmare. Like we, we, it was up to around sixty to 70,000 bikes in the store, in warehouses, makeshift really? warehouses. And yep. for reference, um, what would, you know, pre-COVID levels, uh, how many bikes would be stored in a warehouse where things were normal? I think I wanted to have like 90 days of inventory. Yeah. And I think it was probably around, I don't know, like 10 to 15,000 maybe at a pinch. I, I, I'm yeah. not sure how accurate that is. And that that's in like 28, 30,000 unit warehouse. Yeah, it was crazy. And it was the same situation in New Zealand. I think they had something like six different storage in places, like because there's just not the facilities in New Zealand. So, so then the, the knock-on effects were that we were putting, or the, our warehouse were putting bikes into these temporary storage facilities, effectively that weren't properly operational from an inventory and a pick, pack, and dispatch function. Just put put them away. What happens if someone wants to order these bikes? And those models are in these temporary warehouses, but not in our real operating warehouse. So what they ha- what, what we had to do was get transport to take bikes out of here and put them into our new up, like drive them to our operating <laughs> warehouse. Money just going out the door. Yeah, it was just it was incredible. So that that was the same thing. We had all sorts of inventory mismatch. What was in our main operating warehouse was really low end bikes that filled up early. It was heaps of kids bikes. Things that weren't moving, right? Yeah. So we actually wanted to fulfill orders. It was becoming a mess. We had to ferry them from these temporary storage facilities. It just paid thousands of thousands of dollars. You got 80,000 bikes sitting in a warehouse. Yeah. You got to turn that into cash. So we worked to get those like secondary facilities up and operational, which was good. But the car park one, we, we couldn't because there's no proper storage. There's no racking and there's all that. And then what was happening was because we had like shipments of bikes coming like containers coming out the proverbial and nowhere to put them apart from these because we had a lag before we could set up these these new warehouses and accept and we could only accept a few containers a day right or a couple containers a day we just couldn't dump 50 containers in one day and unpack them all right yeah so what was happening was we had this huge backlog where containers were getting taken off the ship and there was nowhere for them to go so we were accruing demurrage and fees from the wharf for not pulling containers off quick enough. And I can't remember what it is, but let's say it's something like 250 to 300 bucks a day. Maybe, oh, maybe not quite that much. Let's say $200 a day per container. And then once we would take them off our, off the wharf, we still couldn't put them into our warehouse. So luckily our freight forward was amazing during this time. They found a temporary storage facility to put containers so that we weren't paying wharf demurrage or wharf storage fees. But then we have to pay them fees for storage, right? Which was less. But, but better. And then eventually, so once we started, you know, dropping containers off and then returning them to the wharf, it had gone past the detention date. So there's generally, I think it's like, it, it, it varies. 
per shipping line, but seven to 14 days, you have to return an empty container after it arrives. Otherwise, they'll start charging you a similar rate, like say so $200 a day per container. We couldn't meet that, right? So we were just bleeding money, like millions, like getting up over millions of dollars wow. in detention and demurrage fees, um, and temporary storage of these containers. Um, and this is all unaccounted costs. Yeah. to these bikes that we can't sell and that, we, that we're just putting into storage. And then cost of living crisis starts hitting, right? So utilities go up, rent goes up of new warehouses. There's huge competition for getting warehouses because a lot of other retail and other industries are in similar situations where they need to quickly store excess stock. So you t- you're paying premium, right? That yeah. went up like storage of bikes went up like three to fourfold. So it was huh. just the perfect storm. If you had implemented some of the systems that you wanted to successfully, could have this have been avoided at all, or was it still inevitable? I think it was inevitable. Yeah. It's just the feast, right? It was the yeah. the other end of the feast. I think they just got too greedy. They just thought it was gonna they were gonna be able to continue to sell at ridiculous, you know, rates. The bubble burst on them, and it all just happened because of some of those lockdown effects and. Well, not just it all happened at once because Trek is a great company, but in, in my opinion, it's, it's a leisure company. It's a, it's a business which is set up for, for the leisure of management yeah, right. rather than a, a professionally structured business. I can't see, uh, in my opinion, many lessons being learnt and implemented from this. They're, they're just not structured to be able to, to be able to attract and retain talent who will be able to drive the business forward. I think they've lost like 35% of their wholesale staff this year or last year, 20, calendar year 2023. Like I love my time at Trek and I'm, I'm not bitter at all. Like I loved it. It was great. But I, I think that the, the saddest part is, is all good staff leaving. Yeah. The, the other thing that disappoints me is seeing the price of bikes. It's just, and, and me seeing the operational inefficiencies, which probably lead to the fact that bike prices are so high. It just kills me. Right. That part, that was the part that frustrated me. Why is an entry level road bike, aluminium road bike, four grand, three and a half grand? Paying for all these because, cost inefficiencies. Oh, it's just, yeah. And how are you going to get more people on bikes? Matt is no longer with Trek, and nothing that he was hired to do was implemented. There could be very good reason for that, but the end result was that nothing has changed. If Trek is going through this, it's a safe assumption to make that other big brands are too. Actually, I've been told this directly from some of the biggest brands in the world, so you don't need to assume anything. If the magnitude of the problem that Matt describes for Trek exists in little old Australia and New Zealand, multiply this problem by 10 for the US and 20 for Europe, and keep going with many other regions around the world, and then do it again for the other big brands. Now, with all the doom and gloom that the bike industry is facing around the world, the one place that's flourishing is China. I spoke to a gentleman named Sarge Liu, who heads up the direct consumer operations for Specialized China. Sarge told me about the previous bike boom that China experienced in 2008, and then it saw a dramatic slowdown in 2014, which saw a similar problem as the rest of the world is seeing now. Here's what's going on in China now, according to Sarge. The, the equipment um, suddenly becomes quite valuable. Uh, it was discounting um, before the pandemic, and and then it got really popular. Everybody wants it. The market shifted to uh, a consumer's market, uh, to a manufacturer, a, a seller's market, and then you know retailers are demanding full prices for the products. Some some of the products even got a markup, but still. The supplies are really, really short. I, I would dare to say up to today, um, we still don't fully meet the demand of the market yet. Don't know about 2014, but in 2023, we are still short of inventory for many um, models. I, I was speaking to someone just before you who um, works on the manufacturing side of the supply chain, right at this top, and um, or second from the top, from the raw goods. Um, and he said that China has taken a lot of the load off of many of the brands who 
are just overstocked, right? They can't take any more into, say, North America or Europe or whatever. So it's been diverted yeah. to China. Is that something you've seen or? That's yeah. for sure. That, yeah. it, it, is, it is very common. And also when they sell those products in China, um, you know, sometimes they, they stick something in as well. Like you want to take the road bike? Sure. You want, you must have take some mountain bikes as well. They do stuff like that. Right. Everybody does that. Um, the distributors, uh, the subsidiaries, everybody does that. Demand is at 2020 levels. Well, actually, they they are more than 2020. We experience wow. growth every year since 2020. And and yeah, that's right. right. Every year we have a big percentage of growth. And we do expect growth in 2024. However, we have been in, in the industry long enough know that um, when the demand start to drop, it's going to be painful for everybody. So we are very, mm. very cautious about what kind of people we bring into the industry, what kind of people we work with at retail. For the cycling industry, we need to have people that are passionate about cycling. If we work with people that are only in for the money, then, you know, there are, when the, when the cycling industry starts to drop and, uh, you know, or even when something else is, is, you know, coming up and, and they, they think they can make money more easy, uh, in that area and, and they will pack up and go. So we have seen, uh, industry drops and we have experienced that firsthand. And that's why we are very cautious right now. Do you look to that time to learn lessons about how to manage this increased demand and if it were to stop and how to make sure that it's, it's a healthy business? Or do you look to other countries and what they're dealing with in the cycling industry at the moment through COVID for those lessons learned? Well, people never learn. That, that's the hard <laughs> truth, right? Yeah. So when you have demand, um, you, you naturally want to, want to have more inventory to meet this demand. But no, no one can really say for sure when this demand is going to decrease and, and, and when this demand is going to diminish. So I dare to say that inventory problem will exist for China some point in the future. It's going to be a painful process when the demand drops and the inventory is still high. It's going to be the same as the Western world right now. Mm. What we are trying to do is to limit the risk, um, to be not so optimistic and uh, to be really, really careful with we are working with and what kind of inventory um, we keep in stock um, and, and really be precise about the forecast. And one thing I would like to add is that flexibility of, of supply chain. That is also quite important for, for, for cycling industry. For the past few years, I think uh, the wrap up of the, of, the, of the production capacity is quite limited. Compared to what we've seen in China, you know, how the, how the cars are made, the cycling industry is just so primitive. Even, even, even compared with Chinese motorcycles, we're, we're, right now we are seeing a motorcycle market trending down, starting from, I think, the, the, the middle of last year. So we have excess stock inventory uh, and we have, you know, the huge discounts on, on different motorcycles imported or made in China. It's inevitable. Um, but the motorcycle industry seems to have solved their problem in just six to eight months. They have new models coming out. I mean, the, the Chinese manufacturer, uh, they have new model, models coming out and uh, they have new price points. And I think uh, they, have, they have cleared their old stock quite quickly. Um, so the, the flexibility of, of their supply chain is quite impressive, even with the declining um, market demand, uh, they can still uh, innovate and, and produce uh, new models um, to meet the changing market price points. For cycling industry, um, for the years I've been in it, I think our supply chain is way too slow to react. I would say our, our rea reaction time is, is, is more like double of what the motorcycles can do. Established brands in markets like the US or Australia or the UK grow at uh, around a steady 5 to 7%. When you speak of industry growth figures in China, 
what are we talking about currently? Well, I'm, I'm going to just say for the for the whole market. I think in the past few years, the market has been growing at at least fifty percent per year. Five zero at wow. least. Yeah. Really? Okay. So, geez, that's that's amazing. Yeah. For for it's coming from it's, a low base, but the, still. It's the, yeah, it's a it's coming from a low base. That's one point. Um, and and it's just the the pie is getting bigger, uh, and and we have so much space. Uh, empty space around this pie to grow. Um, that's why you, we have mm. this this growth. Yeah, I think more than fifty percent every year, year on year. Yeah, wow. Yeah, Amazing. for the past few years. Amazing. That's the scale of this market. Yeah, and, and also that's I think that's limited by the supply. Back to the United States market. Here's Silka's Josh Portner making some predictions. Do you see this as being, uh, when you say we're close, uh, a year away, two years away, six months away? Do you have a ballpark gut feel? I, I think this next season will we'll clear most of it out. So call it- 2024? Call it a year. Yeah. I mean, I think the the very real possibility that the US achieves the so-called soft landing on the inflation situation, which- you know, you never want to get too optimistic, but kind of looks like it's happening. I mean, you know, there's already debate. We we may already need to be pulling interest rates back. I know, actually, as I talked to you, the, the Tuesday, I think this week is the week that would kind of solidify the the trend to mm-hmm. say, is it is it really real <laughs> or not? And then that'll probably set up the next Fed interest rate move in Q1. If we get there and the Fed lowers even 25 basis points Q1, uh, I think we're back to the races. That would be the indication to the market that it's real rates. I mean, as we've seen, a, you know, even a small Fed rate change will pretty dram- can pretty dramatically affect mortgage rates. You know, I really feel like a, like a lot of the stuff people are feeling now is, is you know, it's real, but a lot there's a lot of angst with it. Mm. And I think if you can just make a couple tweaks around the edges, th- some of the issues will still be there, but the feelings will improve dramatically. So a little consumer confidence bump, mortgage rates coming down, gas prices, I think have to stay low. You know, as much as you'd like to think that high gas prices sell bikes, they they just make people feel poor. And I think with those those things in our favor, we could probably see a, a massive clearing of inventory backlogs in the 2024 season, both in the US and in Europe. And and with that, I think it would would set us up for a much more sober and and realistic 2025 than, than where we are today. Do you think zero interest rate phenomena in this period had anything to do with much of the bike industry and uh, to, where, to where they've gotten to now or? Yeah, t- oh, totally. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Like, like macroeconomics is like one of my hobbies. So you don't get me started. Um, I yeah, no, I mean, I think you all the way back to September 11th, right? I mean, zero percent interest rates fueled the housing boom and subsequent bust. Um, they fueled massive um, accumulation of wealth at the top because you know so much of that money that the Fed, particularly here in America, but it was happening in Europe as well, so much of that money that the Fed was pumping in was just being reinvested by those banks. You know, the, the vision was, we'll give the banks all this money that they can lend, but the banks realized, well, we can just put this in the markets and, and drive the markets up. And, and certainly there was business growth and, and lending. I mean, other stuff was happening, but you know, you look at the the growth and in income and wealth disparities over those time periods that are crazy. Mm. Um, and then 2008 kind of wiped all of it out, but then the bailout again, <laughs> got interest rates, kept them super low. And you had this, we were back to kind of the same old stuff. Yeah. Um, and then with COVID, I think it was our first it's interesting macroeconomically to me, it was really the first time, certainly in America, where you bailed out the every person, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the, the wealthy also got bailed out, but the, the lower and middle income people got these huge bailouts. And I mean, you look at it, like poverty declined. Um, we had not too much compression of uh, wealth disparity, but middle class, uh, you know, both kind of money in the bank, you know, like I think there's some stat that, you know, at any given time, like 25% of Americans couldn't afford a $400 catastrophe. Mm. You know, that's terrifying, right? I mean, you think, my God, like 25% of the people in this country couldn't couldn't cover up a tire blowout mm. uh, on their car 
or, or you know, a medical emergency or something. But yeah, so I think, you know, this was the first time that the euphoria of the aughts and, and then the Obama years was really doubled down on with, you know, not only were we pumping money in at the Fed level, but we were now putting it in to people. And mm. so much of the spending had to come from that. I mean, that was another kind of in our calculus thing of, my God, I, you know, I don't know how much of this money going out to people is coming in to companies like ours, but it, it's non-zero. I mean, it, mm -hmm. that's where some of it's coming from. And so, yeah, I, I, I think absolutely that fueled it. And I think it absolutely, you know, macroeconomically, we have all of that stuff. But then you think of it from a company perspective. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you could get, if you could get money for percent, percent and a half, why not order that next container of bikes, mm. <laughs> you know, in a way where some of our, our smaller companies, you know, like me, like, you know, the core of this company, like who's the financial guarantor of the company? It's me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So if, if the company takes out a million dollars in low interest loans to buy inventory and that inventory doesn't sell and the bank calls that note, I lose everything. Mm. And, you know, I willing to take some risks in my life and in my career and in my business, but there's limits. Mm. And I think certainly, you know, when you look at some of the private equity stuff and these other things that have happened over the last few years, and Wahoo's a good example, right? Got into this kind of amazing, you know, Chip's a great friend and I, I love him to death. And, you know, the company almost imploded because they got into this thing because money was cheap and it was, you know, all this, we could explain how all that works. That should be its own podcast, right? <laughs> right? And I, I do not yeah. know all the details there, but but essentially, interest rates change, and you know the the debt in those deals is typically held by the company. And so now the company's looking around, going, "Oh, hey guys, shit, we gotta we gotta cover. I don't know, pick a number, you know, quarter million yeah. dollars a month in in debt service payments." And yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, the company's now like, well, our first payment has to be to this bank, and then we can pay the rent. And yeah. the electricity and the employees and, 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 and so said it a million times, but you know, it's my, my favorite Warren Buffett line. I think it's everybody's favorite Warren Buffett line, right? You know, when the, the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. And that, that certainly was the, a situation, you know, there are far more people out there swimming naked due to cheap money than there would have been had that, that not been the case. And I, mm -hmm. I think you could make a, a very real argument that year, two years into the Trump administration, Powell put the rate up and Trump absolutely threw a tantrum and they capitulated and they lowered it. I think that's a moment we can really, really point to and say that really made things a lot worse in the future. Right. I think had we, you know, I think had we been at a spot where we'd gotten it up to a couple percent and then maybe we wouldn't have had to cut it quite as low. And then there's a million ways you could game plan that out. Here's Tay Huang again, formerly of QBP, the largest distributor in the U.S. All the shops that I ever I ever worked in always had bikes, you know, in the in the basement that should have been gone years ago, or you know, multiple. Oh, hey, look! I just found two full Durace groups in the back corner of the basement. Right? Mm. How many generations back are these? Wow! Someone screwed up. Right? Uh, yeah. Is it fair to say that for a lot of retailers, this situation is similar to that? I mean, I go back to thinking that I feel bad knocking on retailers, but most retailers should have come into at least this calendar year with the plan of carrying as little inventory as they could, right? If they bought heavy into 2022, I get that. But then we also had a normal return to seasonality before that. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, 2020 into 2021 was unusual because winter never happened, right? We just had that big fat bike revenue flow on through. Uh, but 2020 into 22, uh, 2021 into 2022, there was that seasonal dip came back, right? And nothing about the sales in the 2022 season, I think, indicated that they should have gone heavy into 2023. Again, that's easy for me to say from my perspective. I had a lot of information. You know, we're talking almost a year removed from all that. Is it just the bike shops that are overstocked, or because, from my understanding, as I said earlier, the brands were pressuring bike shops to order, mm -hmm. put your orders in. You can cancel if you want, and many did. 
So is there mm-hmm. a backup of, well, I mean, it sounds like it is because, you know, buy one, get one freeze and, um, and, and brand direct on online discounting. There's a backup in the, the brands or distributors as well, isn't there? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. And, and frankly, that was, that was one of our selling pitches for, for retailers is, you know, we'll never hold it over your head that you have to get minimums, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe you lose out on some discounts. But our discounts are just margin patterns anyway. It's not going to make or break your business. Our, our default margins are tried to be set so that they're profitable for retailers. But the reality is, is most shops can't cut themselves free of Trek Specialized Giant or don't know how to or don't want to, right? right. There are plenty of retailers that don't have them and they're successful or they choose to partner with a smaller brand like Cannondale and Kona and they can you know, push back a lot more effectively. But yeah, if, if you're in a situation where specialized comes and says, you have to, you have to take on this debt and you're not in a position to say no. Yeah. You're kind of stuck in an unenviable position, I I suppose. Um, In that situation, I would hope that specialized is working with them, like actively working with them to figure out how to move that inventory. You know, I want to see bike retailers continue to thrive because it's, it's it's the home base for cycling, right? But the flip side is folks at the big three, if they're not moving inventory through their dealer channels, then they're going to find somewhere else to move that inventory. Um, and we've already seen that, you know, sales from Trek and Specialized on their websites. I don't know what the, what the retail situation is like where you're at, but uh, Trek and Specialized have been buying a ton of retailers over here. Yeah. Uh, and so to some extent, they have a place they can put all that product and no one's going to say no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, huh. Of course, that just makes it harder for any other non-company owned, you know, Trek dealers in the vicinity of a Trek shop then. Yeah. But yeah. Jake Dudick, formerly of Weagle Chain Reaction, made a comment in his LinkedIn post that I've put up in the show notes about capacity never leaving the way it should in the bike industry. In many ways, he said, it's similar to the airline industry. I asked Jake to elaborate on this point because I thought it was really, really interesting. Yes, it's interesting. Like there's, when you look at an industry and like how attractive or unattractive it's it's potentially going to be, you have, of course, there are many factors involved, but um, one framework to use is thinking about an industry in terms of like, barriers to entry and the barriers to exit. So how high are the hurdles for someone to get in to this industry? How much investment is required for someone to get in to this industry? And then the exit, you know, like if, if the industry goes upside down and things are bad, profits are low, demand declines, like how hard is it for somebody to exit that industry? In the airline business, so you'll have it's kind of interesting because you always want to think of it in terms of, of the capacity, like can the capacity leave or not? Mm-hmm. And in the airline industry, the capacity never leaves uh, because even if you have a carrier that, that they go bankrupt, you know, like if they, they lease a bunch of planes and, you know, they get, they convince Boeing and Airbus and folks to make these things. So you've got all these planes. And then even if that carrier goes bankrupt, you know, it's not like the plane just like goes to the recycling center. Like someone go, they, someone buys that lease for pennies on the dollar, and the airplane remains, and the capacity remains. You know, you still have a bunch of seats that need you know to get used. And so, what happens with that is is the new owner of this plane, like they need to utilize the capacity, uh, and so that puts pressure on price. On the bike side of the world, there are a lot of different reasons um, that you know barriers to exit. Uh, would would raise and in some industries uh, it can really be a function of of just it's either the shareholders or the management team or the owner operator they just they have like an emotional tie to the industry there's there's mm-hmm. there's some irrational tie that's that's keeping them in this space when by all logic and reason it's like they should exit you know like you you'd be better off just like taking this money that you have and like putting it in you know like an ETF fund because it's going to generate better returns than you're getting in what you're doing right now right and for a number of different reasons like psychological reasons you know they ignore this and they continue clinging into this space even when you have a bankruptcy occur 
you can have, you know, new money that comes in and they see this as like, this is a romanticized space and they've always wanted to be a part of this romanticized space, not really understanding the characteristics of the industry structure and how uh, difficult it is when you're in an industry that has high barriers to exit. Uh, and so then the brand remains, the capacity remains. <clears throat> so, you know, the industry hasn't been through a real, it's, they don't know if it's ever really been through like a, a major shakeout period. And when I say a shakeout period, that's it's it's a time, a difficult time in an industry. The folks that shouldn't be around, they die off, you know, mm. it, like it, liquidation, bankruptcy, capacity leaves. Over the course of the next probably six to nine months, there's going to be more bankruptcies, you know, like without a doubt. You've already mm. started to see a couple, I think, orange just mm. went into insolvency. Are they going to stay or is is new money going to come in, try to keep these things on life support? You know, like rather than keep a brand, you know, living in a persistent vegetative state, sometimes the capacity genuinely needs to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll be interesting to see what happens like during this, this shakeout period. So there's, there's that aspect to it. And then the other thing that probably caught the most attention from, from bike industry people out of my article was, um, the chart that kind of looks at like the percent change in real value of U.S. bike imports, you know, versus the percent change in U.S. cycling participation. Mm. Um, pulled this data when I was when I was working for Cigna. You know, I was I was trying trying to frame up like the aspects of of the industry structure and um, what are the hot spots, what are not the hot spots. And when I came across this, and I started to manipulate data in a certain way. And it especially became apparent, you know, when I chained it all to 2019 dollars, which means like I eliminated the effects of inflation, basically. That percent change, you know, relative in, in what you're importing relative to a basic driver of demand, which would be participation. I was like, holy cow, these guys are all over the map. They're so volatile in their procurement just relative to like basic indications of demand. And so what that, you know, said to me, looking at things all the way, going all the way back to 2008 is like, this is not a COVID problem. Yeah. It's a big problem. Like COVID has really spiked things, but like they've been doing this for, for decades. Like this is a problem that's been around since the dawn of time for these guys. You know, I think that obviously going through a shakeout period and if capacity uh, goes away, that's, that is helpful. Participation does a pretty predictable thing, right? And it hangs out around zero growth. So, you know, mm -hmm. you have folks that age out of the sport and you have folks that come into the sport and it more or less happens at the same rate. Mm -hmm. um, but procurement doesn't reflect that at all. Right. So like what a massive supply and demand imbalance. Mm -hmm. And while if you, I'm looking at this chart right now, just to remind myself about it, it probably averages out around 0%, which is right where where participation is, but boy, it's very volatile around that 0%. <laughs> you know, yeah. you have these like huge spikes in procurement growth. And then several years later, it falls off of a cliff. And then a few years after that, you're like the backup at, you know, 20% year over year procurement growth. And it's like, I, I personally believe that the drivers of this are not going to be the teeny itty bitty tiny brands that, you know, might go into insolvency. The drivers of this type of volatility like these are major procurement people. So these are the Trek, a specialized, the Cannondale, a giant, the pawns of the world. Um, you know, like they need to be kind of thinking long and hard about how volatile this procurement pattern is that, that they have in their industry. Remember when Ellery said at the beginning of this episode that the market has begun to normalize and it's cyclically appropriate. This is what Jake is talking about when he refers to participation averaging out at zero, but procurement spiking all over the place year to year. This is the cycle it appears we're back into. And it's also a good insight into how the bike industry sells the same stuff largely to the same people every year. It surprises me that people in the bike industry have come to you surprised about this insight. Does this appear to be new information? It feels like this should be widely known. It's certainly not. I don't, maybe it just hasn't been pieced together in this way, you know, like looking at it in terms of a percent change or maybe folks haven't, you know, tried to 
pull the effects of inflation out of it, uh, which it does change the chart a little bit when you chain it, you know, to yeah. a, to a dollar value. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I'm not. I'm not sure why people haven't tried to kind of understand aggregate supply and what that's done. It's actually pretty easy for us to understand the, the bike space to understand aggregate supply because you know 90 percent of bikes are are being imported. So you can at least like mm. there's a you can at least clock that at you know mm. that the ports. Um, it'd be different if there were you know people making 50 percent of bike units. Uh, you know, out of U.S. factories, and if it wasn't tracked as well, but these are coming in through ports. Like these numbers are pretty trackable. So the folks that need to stay, very important that you know the person who loved love the bike space. You know, like love love cycling, love bikes. Uh, I'm I'm not so passionate about it that like I will irrationally stay in place. But it, it, I have a soft spot in my heart for it, right? And so I think like my advice to businesses, to brands that like are going to face there's going to be some turbulent times over the course of the next 12 to 18 months still. If you have a competitive advantage, like meaning, you know, like if you look at the landscape, whether you're on the retail side or you're a brand, a competitive advantage means that relative to your peers, you know, you either have lower costs or you can charge higher prices or both, like period, full stop. If you don't have that, you need to seriously consider like, is it worth like staying in this space? Is it, is it, is it worth like your capital that you've committed? You know, like think about the risks that are associated with operating in the space. It's it's really it's volatile. You know, like I think that the supply diagram kind of already implies like there's a lot of volatility here, uh, and with volatility there's risk. Is it worth the risk? You know, for what you're doing. Like if you're operating a brand that doesn't have a competitive advantage, is it worth it or not? Should or should you should you rationally exit? Like a, mm. that's a serious question that people just need to be like intellectually honest with themselves about, right? The ones that there's some phenomenal shops out there, right? And that they're well run, they deliver value to to consumers, and it, you know, it's like those are the guys that I, I hope they can fight and claw, you know, to mm. to do make it go the distance, you know, like mm. make it through the marathon. The ones that if they're, and I guess we're just talking about shops uh, for now, which is obviously different than the brands. Um, it's almost becomes like those are maybe even harder questions for the for the shop owners to answer because they are so many of them are like very passion induced projects right mm. to, to run a shop running a shop is not an easy business by any means uh, and so they are like they're almost inherently willing you know to take you know lower returns like a lower return profile on their capital that they're that they're investing in these things than you would otherwise because it's like well they just they love doing this and they want to do this and like they don't care if they're not going to make that much money doing it right yeah. um there's a lot of emotion that's in there and mm. to to weed through that and approach assess your position of your business the performance of it you know the financial position of it and the future ahead to assess that objectively for them is like it's, it's very difficult understandably um but i do think that everyone owes it to themselves to to at least ask and answer that question What you've heard in this four-part series are a selection of anecdotes out of countless conversations I've had with people in the bike industry that are representative of recurring themes I've heard again and again. This isn't intended to be an inquiry or postmortem of what went wrong in the bike industry during the pandemic, but more to tell the human side of the story. I hope I've captured the general themes accurately. Since this series has been published, People in the industry have told me that it was both traumatic and cathartic listening. And there are many topics that I didn't get into that I wish we could have. All good stories finish with a resolution at the end, but this is far from being done and I honestly don't know how to wrap up with a satisfying conclusion. Many bike shops, businesses, manufacturers still need to see this through. Throughout this series, I've referred to the industry as the hard and soft good businesses, but spare a thought to all the event organizers and tour companies who didn't experience a boom throughout COVID and their businesses came to a complete standstill. Many of them never got back up and running again, and they play a critical part in the whole ecosystem. The term right sizing has been thrown around, and while we all understand what this means, it's a cold-hearted way that an economist would look at a macro view of the industry and it removes the human cost to all of this. 
The bike industry is full of passionate people who could be making a better income elsewhere, but they choose to do this because it's a wonderful thing to be a part of. There's an activity and a sport at the heart of all of this, and we all want to see it grow. The community that we're all a part of is held together by local bike shops, clubs, brand support, and volunteers. Part of its charm is that it's largely a cottage industry, and what type of place would this be if it were full of cutthroat business people that were only here to make a buck? I'd like to thank Ellery Slater, Josh Portner, Tay Huang, Rob Jatellis, Jake Dudick, and all the other people I spoke to in this series for your time, insights, and sharing your stories. And a big thank you to the countless messages from everyone I've received during the series. Also, thank you to Will Jones and Hugh Owen from Red Bricks Media for producing this podcast, Ashley Deneef for composing the music, and our executive producer, Craig Bruce, as well as the rest of the Escape Collective team for sharing their industry contacts and ideas towards this project. We're going to be doing a bonus episode 5 where we'll be doing a Q&A from our Escape Collective members and looking at some of the things that came out of the woodwork during the release of these episodes. Stay tuned for that. This is Wade Wallace from Escape Collective. Thank you for listening.